financial system and we're doing just fine. The problem with that, so um, you can see down here, um, this is where we're at right now, about 8% un uh, unemployment. That is the number that you hear everywhere in the media. But the problem is that the government decided that unemployment was looking a little bit too toppy in the early 90s. And so they changed how it was calculated. And, but, so if you take all of the statistics today and use the government's own methods for figuring out unemployment, but the methods from 20 years ago, you get the blue line on top. This isn't, um, so this is from John Williams at Shadow Stats. Some of you might be familiar with his work. And um, <clears throat> so what he's, what he's doing is he's just taking, this isn't his opinion, he's taking the methods that the government used 20 years ago <coughs> for unemployment. And he comes up with 22, 23%. So if we do an apples to apples comparison of our unemployment, versus depression area, it's very close to the same. And what's the difference? Well, they, the, they like to do all kinds of interesting statistical things to make the numbers look better. One a lot of you might know about, if you are unemployed for six months and one day, you're not unemployed according to the government. You are a discouraged worker and you don't fall into this chart. The talking heads on CNBC will no longer talk about you because you don't count anymore. Um, also, if you're a high wage, you know, a nuclear engineer or something like that, and you lose your job and you just look, look and look and look and can't find anything, and now you take some job, um, you know, 10 hours a week, making 10% uh, uh, of what you used to, you're not unemployed. Whereas you used to be unemployed by the statistical method of the government. This is the next uh, chart. Why do we care about inflation? A um, couple days ago I was driving home and listening to financial news and they were, they were spouting 2% inflation. And boy, isn't it great, at least we've got all these problems, at least we don't need to worry about inflation. <laughs> and so we can actually print as much money as we want to because it's not a problem. Well, sorry to tell you, and they uh, changed how they figure out inflation even earlier than they, um, they changed the methods for unemployment. In, uh, over on the left side, it's uh, 1980, right here. And, um, and you can see that, that uh, the top line again is the old method for figuring out inflation, and this is the new method. And we're at about 2% right there. But hold on, if you use the government's own methods before <coughs> 1980 to figure out inflation, we're just below 10%. So let's think about that for a second. If you go to the bank today and get a $100 bill and put it in your drawer and take it out next Thanksgiving, you can only buy $91 worth of stuff, according to this. That's pretty bad up. And tell me again why we don't have to worry about inflation. And so let's see, let's see if there's anybody in this room for whom this uh, uh, red line actually applies. Well, let's see if we're a, if we're all red liners or blue liners. So first, we need to consider a few questions. So you first, you have to think: Do you ever buy food? Does any does everybody in this room buy food? Yeah. Mm. Um, who here fills their car with gasoline or buys, uh, okay, um, who, did, probably a few of us here either pay college tuition or have children that we support with college tuition, um, and does anybody here ever see the doctor? Do you ever go to the doctor at all, anyone? Okay, so if you said yes to any of those things, you're the blue line. There's only fictitious people that are the red line there. I've never met anybody like that. But yet, that's, that's the one, the only one, the only one they ever talk about on the mass media. Don't ask me why. I don't know. But that's what they talk about. So 
Now we come to the last problem that we have is the national debt. And don't worry, these numbers are so huge, they don't really mean anything to any of us, right? <laughs> but I'm going to go through them really fast, and then I've got a couple of slides that will put them in, more, in better perspective. Um, because these numbers are just crazy big. So our, our cash debt as of yesterday was $16,289,000,000,000. Sounds pretty bad, right? Nope. Nothing. It's peanuts. The unfunded liabilities is what we need to worry about because that <coughs> is what the government needs to come up with when you consider all of the promises that they've made. All of the Social Security, all of the, you know, all of the items that they've decided that need to be funded eventually. And what's so crazy about that is last July I was doing research for this, and it was $2 trillion less. And just since last July, it's going up about $10 trillion a year. Just unbelievable. But nobody cared. Nobody, what talking heads on CNBC are going to talk about that? Nobody. Nobody will ever tell you about that. Why? Again, I don't know. But they don't want to talk about it. So I've got some... Uh, uh, budget figures here from 2010, because that's just what I happen to have. It's very similar right now. Uh, the U.S. income was 2.1 trillion. Uh, federal budget was 3.8, and so the difference between them is approximately 1.6 trillion dollars. Okay, and then um, they all, they had a, a, a government shutdown that they averted in April of 2011, um, and. Uh, this is what they came up for cuts, $38 billion, about 1% of the budget. So not very much. So now we'll put these, in, these numbers in perspective. And the first thing we've got to figure out, well, what's a trillion dollars anyway? Um, I don't know too many trillionaires. Um, but I would have suspect if I was one, I could buy anything I wanted to. So the best way that I like to think about what a trillion dollars is, is if you went to the bank and took out one hundred, uh, took out a trillion dollars in one hundred dollar bills, how much is that? So if you stacked one hundred dollar bills, and by stacking I don't mean like this end to end, I mean like this. I mean just stack it as tightly as you can. If you stacked one trillion dollars worth of hundred dollar bills, it would reach six hundred seventy miles. And I've seen different figures for this, some say 640, some say 690, but this is a pretty good average of the ones that I've seen, 670 miles. So think about this for a second. If you get in your car and you drive from here to San Francisco with $100 bills stacked along the freeway the whole way, $100 bills stacked tightly along the freeway, you actually don't quite get to trillion dollars. That's how much a trillion dollars is. It's just mind-bogglingly huge. Um, another good way to think about our debt situation is to think about um, the U.S. budget like if it was a family. And so here, um, in this example, um, I'm removing eight zeros from all of those numbers we just looked at. And we're going to think about it in terms of we're the Jones family, and um, we have certain financials, you know, we've got a certain income and, and certain debts, and we're walking into the bank, and we want to get a, a, a new loan, and we've got to convince this banker that we're a good risk. So, <clears throat> taking eight zeros off of all the numbers we just looked at, the total annual income for this family is $21,700. All right, at least they have an income. The amount of money the Jones family spent this year is $38,200. Now, if you're any kind of a banker, right there you go, wait, <coughs> hold on. You make $21,000 and you spent $38,000. You know, this only happened one year, right? No, it happens every year. Um, and so he's kind of looking at him with a John's aside. And it's like, well, do you have any, uh, you know, so you added this much money. $16,500 for the credit card this year. And you think about it, it really is adding it to the credit card. Because if it was a car loan or a house loan, something like that, you have collateral, right? And, uh, and you, if you get in trouble, you can 
you can trade in the car or the house and get the money back. No, this amount is credit card debt. It's been vaporized. It's gone, and this happens every year. Next, next thing, you know, if the if the if the banker hasn't already thrown him out of his office, the outstanding balance in the credit card is $162,000 for somebody who makes $21,000 a year. This that's just crazy. And so the banker, you can imagine the banker now going. I just don't see it. I don't think we can give you guys a loan. This is kind of crazy. Why don't you come back, make another appointment with me, go home, talk to your wife, and decide what you can cut from your budget. Okay? And so that's what they did in 2011. They, they went and they, they argued for months about what they could cut from the budget. And they finally come out and they go, victory! Victory is ours. We've decided what we're going to cut and, and we've made some really hard decisions. We've cut $385. <laughs> and that, that is our government. Would you loan somebody like this money? I sure wouldn't. And it's only a matter of time before nobody in the world will, will loan these people money. <laughs> Nothing to worry about here. Um, so just how bad is our debt compared to other countries? Because that, that's a good way of looking at it. What's, what's our debt compared to other countries? So over here, um, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, compare ourselves to other countries based on debt to GDP. And so the reason why we don't just look only at debt, because you know, imagine if we had a trillion dollars of debt and Honduras had a trillion dollars of debt. It's not the same thing, right? Because our economy produces more than the Honduran economy does. So that's not a good, just dollars isn't a good enough measure. You need to, um, you need to look at a ratio between what the debt is and what your pro, uh, economy produces in a year. And, um, and that's one measure of that is, is gross domestic product. It's not a perfect measure, but it's, it's a good measure of what economies produce in a year. So if you're 100% debt to GDP, and say you, uh, your debt is $16 trillion, um, that means that, um, that your GDP is also $16 trillion. So that's what 100% right here would be. And so you can see the people who are really in bad shape here, you got Greece, you know, the favorite of the news media right now. You got Italy, they're at 120%. But look at who's at 100%. Ireland and the US. We're in the same fiscal situation as Ireland. Their banks have already collapsed. Um, but what's even worse, what, what's even harder to take, is look who we're worse than. Portugal and Spain. So Spain, you can open up, uh, you know, any news, uh, uh, newspaper or whatever and read about Spain, they're having riots, they've got 25% unemployment, their youth unemployment is over 50%, their banks are literally collapsing and they have need regular infusions of cash. They're a huge basket case, but their debt is only about 75% debt to GDP. And we're 100%, how do we get away with that? Does, it, does anybody have any idea how we get away with that? Preserve currency? Yes, and we're going to get into that. Very good. You get an A. <laughs> and um, and uh, in addition to that, we can print our own money. Spain can't print their own money. Their, their hands are tied. They're having to face the piper right now, and we don't have to. And I thought this was very interesting. In the early 2000s, the Congressional Budget Office was really worried about the debt to GDP. They were like, Wow, you guys, we've looked at the figures. And, you know, we might hit 100% debt to GDP by 2050. And they were very worried about that. But we're already there in just that amount of time. Alfred E. Newman doesn't care. Just, uh, you can just uh, add any politician you can name right here. <laughs> Almost any politician. <clears throat> This is a picture of an actual Bank of Zimbabwe note. Hundred trillion dollars. This is actually what it looks like. I guess it was worth five dollars last time I, what, I checked. What did they bring when they want to buy a car or something? <laughs> a little girl. <laughs> yeah. Maybe like five goats. <laughs> 
So, um, but what's interesting is the guy who is responsible for this, the guy who's responsible for this kind of inflation, Dr. Gideon Gono, he's the ch uh, chairman of the Central Bank of Zimbabwe. He's even seeing the writing on the wall for the United States. He says the huge budget deficits accumulated by the United States is leading to a resistance to relying on the U.S. dollars as a base currency. I mean, even a guy like this sees it. it he's saying, you guys are printing too much money. You're going to run into some problems. So if a guy like that can see it, I think we're in big trouble. Um, so... This time is different. It's the name of a book that is basically a prequel to where the United States is headed. It's a very interesting book that was written by Carmen Reinhardt and Kenneth Rogoff. They're two academic economists that, crazily enough, actually still understand the economy. And these guys, this is the science part of the economics. These guys actually have taken data from about a hundred different countries over the last 200 and more years that have had financial crises, you know, banking crises, uh, their monetary collapse, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and they've studied this in detail. There's hundreds of pages of charts.